Kings go to war. The war spills over, causing others to get involved just to rescue a family member. And then for the kicker, a king of righteousness, who is a priest of God, just shows up out of nowhere with bread and wine, gives a blessing, and receives a tenth of the spoils. Welcome to a beginner's commentary to the book of Genesis, chapter 14. Welcome back to the channel and welcome back to this teaching series. Oh, excuse me. Hey, we're being sponsored by MichaelLawsonSpeaks.com where you can get this captivating Christian unisex hoodie. It is the perfect blend of faith and fashion for individuals like yourself who appreciate the essence of Christian streetwear or this character traits backpack that is part of the periodical table of character traits book collection that is all about character from a biblical perspective complete with the mug each sold separately of course you can get yours today at michaellawsonspeaks.com let's get into chapter 14 chapter 14 verses 1 through 9 and it came about in the days of Amraphel, king of Shinar, Arioch, king of Elisar, Kedolorimar, king of Elam, and Tidal, king of Goyim, that they made war with Bera, king of Sodom, and Birsha, king of Gomorrah, Shinab, king of Adma, and Shimabar, king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, that is, Zoar. All these kings came as allies to the valley of Sidim, that is, the Salt Sea. For twelve years they had served Kedolaomer, but in the thirteenth year they rebelled. And in the 14th year, Kedor Lamar and the kings who were with him came and defeated the Raphaim in Ashtaroth, Kimaim, and the Zuzim in Ham, and the Emin in Sheva, Kiriathim, and the Horites on their Mount Seir as far as El Paran, which is by the wilderness. Then they turned back and came to Ein Mishpat, that is Kadesh, and conquered all the country of the Amalekites and also the Amor Amoris who lived in Hazazon Tamar and the king of Sodom and the king of Gomorrah, the king of Adma and the king of Zeboim and the king of Bela, that is Zoar, came out, and they lined up for battle against them in the valley of Sidim, against Kedolomar, king of Elam, Tidal, king of Goyim, Amraphel, king of Shinar, and Ariok, king of Alasar, four kings against five. Whew, that was tough. When kings go to war, there is a massive war that covered many miles. Now, if you were to look at this on a map, you'd see that it started in the north of what is now Israel, just south of Damascus. The war continued south, just east of Jerusalem, on the other side of the Salt Sea, extending down just extending down to just the tip of the Sea of Reeds, working its way westward into the territory of the Amalekites before heading northeast to the opposite side of the Salt Sea. Continuing with verses 10 through 13. Now, the valley of Sid Sidon was full of tar pits, and the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled, and they fell into them. But those who survived fled to the hill country. They took all the possessions of Sodom and Gomorrah 
and all their food supply and departed. They also took Lot, Abram's nephew, and his possessions and departed, for he was living in Sodom. So let's check out the spoils of war. Here we see that the decision of Lot to live in Sodom was not a good one because he has not only found himself in the middle of an exceedingly wicked culture, but now he becomes a casualty of a war that he has nothing to do with. What once looked good to his eyes has now become a terror to his very life. You see, we need to be very careful about the things that are pleasing to our eyes instead of looking to God for what he has for us. Remember in the garden when Eve saw that it was pleasing to the eyes? Let's continue with verses 13 through 16. Then a survivor came and told Abram the Hebrew, now he was residing by the oaks of Mamre, the Amorite, brother of Eshcol and brother of Honor, and they were allies with Abram. When Abram heard that his relative had been taken captive, he led out his trained men, born in his house, numbering 318, and went in pursuit as far as Dan. Then he divided his forces against them by night, he and his servants, and defeated them and pursued them as far as Hobah, which is north of Damascus. He brought back all the possessions and also brought back his relative Lot with his possessions and also the women and the other people. Abram to the rescue. Notice what Abram does upon hearing the news that his nephew had been taken captive. He acted immediately. It is strange that the number of trained men is 318. Why not round up? Why use this very specific number? Now, I can't get into that now since this is a beginner's commentary, but I wanted you to at least ponder it for yourself. But ask yourself, how do 318 trained men defeat the armies of five kings? I also want to point out the word used to identify Abram that was made by the sole survivor, he called him Hebrew. That word in Hebrew translates to the other side, meaning Abram was from over there. To understand this, we have to look at the deeper meaning of Abram's calling. Remember, Abram was called out from an idol-worshiping people to serve and follow the one true God. So Abram was literally and spiritually called out from the other side, just like you hopefully have been called out of sin and darkness and into the glorious light of God. Moving on with verses 16 through 20. Then after his return from the defeat of Kedor Lamar and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom went out to meet him at the valley of Shaveh, that is, the king's valley. And Malchizedek, the king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. Now he was a priest of God Most High, and he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God Most High, who has handed over your enemies to you. And he gave him a tenth of everything. Who is Malchizedek? Malchizedek? Here we are. One of the most obscure 
and confusing pieces of scripture that has been debated over years. Out of nowhere comes a king who we've never been introduced to, who just shows up and blesses Abram with an amazing blessing as if he is speaking for God. And then Abram just gives him a tenth of everything he had from his spoils. Clearly, God was with Abram in order for him to defeat the armies of five kings with only 318 trained men. Normally, when you defeat a king back in that time, you removed his head, paraded it around, cut off a piece of his cloak and attached it to yours, signifying your great power. Abram did none of that, which means it was only about getting his nephew back and everything that was taken. But where did this priest of God Most High come from? Why did he bring bread and wine? And why did Abram give him a tenth? These are great questions that we will try to address. First, we know he just appeared out of nowhere. There is no mention of his beginning or his end. Bread and wine were a customary offering considering his trained men were probably hungry and thirsty after the battles. This is the very first mention of a tithe or tenth given to someone other than God. If you recall, Cain and Abel were the first to give an offering or a tenth, but it was to God as a thank you for blessing them with crops and animals. This instance is different. Abram gives a tenth to the priest of God most high after he is blessed by him. So the priest of God most high is very important, but isn't just a man because he was speaking for God. Or was he something more? Continuing with verses 16 through 20. <clears throat> then the king of Sodom said to Abram, Give the people to me and take the possessions for yourself. But Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have sworn to the Lord God most high, possessor of heaven and earth, that I will not take a thread or a sandal strap or anything that is yours, so that you do not say I have made Abram rich. I will take nothing except what the young men have eaten and the share of the men who went with me, Honor, Eshkol, and Mamre. Let them take their share. Let's talk about this honorable man. Notice how Abram has every right to the spoils of battle, but instead refuses to take anything because he is a man of high moral character who answers to God with whom he made a promise to. He is not swayed by the luster from the spoils, but remains true to his convictions and promise. And get this, this is a great opportunity for Abram to quote, unquote, help the Lord with his promise to bless him by thinking that the timing is right and that he just won a battle with very few men, so it has to be ordained by the Lord. So I should have a right to these spoils because of course that's exactly how we think sometimes, right? But not. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance towards you and give you peace. Amen. See you right here next time for chapter 
Good day.